This is my very first Jason Hartman conference. I've been listening to his podcasts, and I have been learning a lot there. But already in the past couple hours, I've learned about what more to look for on pro formas. I've already learned quite a bit that I didn't know I didn't know. And I'm looking forward to learning so much more the rest of this conference so that I can make better investments. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is episode number 284. I'm your host, Jason Hartman. Thanks for joining me today. Last episode, I was talking with Steve during the intro portion of that episode. And, you know, we covered a lot of things, but we still had a few things we meant to cover that we did not cover, including Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Warren Buffett, and our referral program that we just wanted you to know a little bit more about. Steve, welcome back. How are you? Hey, doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. So, hey, we went so long last time. What do you want to talk about today? We we got into that whole conversation about hedge funds and, you know, Oxif and, and the, the uh, smoke and mirrors fake economy versus the real economy and income property being a fragmented market, but that's really the benefit of it. You had a couple articles and things that you wanted to cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, we went all over the place. That's for sure. We're going to try to not do that again. Oh, come on. We, you know we will. Okay, fine. Well, there was an interesting article on Inman News uh, titled Fannie and Freddie Becoming Wards of the State, which they certainly are. (laughs) You know, a ward of the state under the traditional sense, meaning somebody who uh, is unable or unwilling to take care of themselves, sometimes even a prisoner, and the state's just completely in charge of them. They belong to them. And, you know, we've we've all been told, oh, Fannie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are private companies. But Anybody who's paying attention, they're the U.S. post office of private companies. I mean, we all know it's not true with with all the funding that they get. And so, yeah, they are essentially on life support with the federal government. The guarantees and the backing by the Fed that they receive allow them to do what they would be able to do. And I, I think what's most important to mention here is if Fannie Mae wasn't in, I'll just call it cahoots, that's how I see it. With the federal government, the business practices that they've implemented would never, not in a million years, have allowed them to survive in the general marketplace. Not a chance. Oh, yeah, not a chance. I remember, who was it? Franklin Raines. He just ripped that company off, left with a huge golden parachute. And during the day, he was revered as some genius who was just creating homeownership for so many people and doing all these wonderful things. And I remember going to a meeting of the Mortgage Bankers Association. And, and you know, it's it, all, it almost like reminds me of like Lance Armstrong. All you got to do, folks, and I, I don't even know if the Lance Armstrong thing is really was he doping. It seems like it because he gave up and stopped fighting it. And, you know, so he fell from grace. And a lot of these, a lot of these people that are just like these revered people. This is why I never really put my stock in a single person. I'll believe in a political philosophy, but I'm not going to believe in a person because I've just been led down too many times. I'm sorry if I'm so cynical, but you know, I, I'm not going to say, oh, Romney, Romney, Romney. You know, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to go with the philosophy. Romney's a turnaround specialist. He's still a globalist, just like Obama. I don't think we're ever going to get a real choice. But, you know, given the choice, I mean, he's easily the better candidate. The country is a business, okay? And, you know, I want a businessman in there, not a guy with no resume who's never done anything real in his life, who has this 
past shrouded shrouded in secrecy. Where's his college records? All this kind of stuff, right? Enough of that. But the the point being is that when you look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, okay, they may become nationalized. The better thing would be to just let them go under. And so many of our investors have said, Jason, what if Fannie and Freddie go away and the mortgage market dries up and people don't have access to all these great low interest rate mortgages? Won't that cause housing prices to decline? Well, my answer is, yeah, probably. They probably will decline, at least initially. They'll they'll decline. I think so. But guess what, folks? There's always a counterbalance to everything in life. So say housing prices plummet. And why do they plummet? Well, they plummet because people don't have access to cheap mortgages with low down payments. Okay, then hmm, the population is still increasing. People still need a place to live. So what are they forced to do? Hmm, another four-letter word I really like, rent. So they're forced to rent. They only have three choices. They rent, buy, or be homeless. And so rents, the, the counterbalance to purchasing, when I teach the three dimensions of real estate, this is part of it. If you see the housing market is fueled by cheap mortgage money and low down payment mortgage money and ease of qualifying. So if you don't have those three things, then people can't buy. If you do have those three things, they can buy like crazy and prices tend to go up and it creates a bubble. You know, we've been through that way too many times. We've seen those bubbles inflate. In fact, we see a bubble starting to inflate again now. It's not that severe yet, but I still think it has a long way to go. But there are signs that a bubble is being blown up right now as we speak in the midst of this terrible economy and this fake recovery. But if if people can't buy, they got to rent. So if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went out of business, I mean, I would welcome that because rents would skyrocket. And remember, we're cash flow investors. Our clients are cash flow investors. We're not gamblers. One of the Ten Commandments of Successful Investing is thou shalt not gamble. We buy properties that make sense the day we buy them. And the way they make sense is from a cash flow perspective. And I think if you see a Republican Congress and you see a Republican president, you would just have a lot of pressure for no more bailouts, no more no more nationalization, no more bailouts to these criminals that basically run the banking system. And so the likelihood of Fannie and Freddie being cast aside would be greater. Now, if you have Obama and you have more Democrats in Congress, well, the likelihood of kicking the can down the road and propping up these entities that don't work and that are insolvent, that'll be higher. So then what do you have? Well, you'll have a likelihood of a greater bubble being inflated. The rents won't go up so much. Rents will just do their normal thing. They'll escalate as they always have throughout history. But they're not going to skyrocket like they would if Fannie and Freddie went away, if cheap mortgage money went away. And, you know, then ultimately a couple years later, the private market would start to come in and fill the needs. And instead of getting a mortgage for 3 or 4%, well, you'd pay six or eight or nine percent and prices would maybe adjust downward to compensate for the mortgage rates but rents would be much much higher so if you like investing for cap rate cash on cash return or overall return on investment not considering appreciation hey especially cash on cash that's the major one here if you like investing for cash on cash return you just better hope that fannie mae and freddie mac go under because that's where you're really going to benefit. Steve, your thoughts? Yeah, all all very good points and kind of uh, bringing it uh, all around. You know, we're we're very close to the presidential election here, and I was watching the news this morning, and uh, President Obama was out on the stump. And, you you know, it's that point in the election where – no matter what political party you belong to, you're you're kind of nauseated with everything, <laughs> you know, and hearing the same talking points over and over again. And and one of President Obama's more popular ones is, do we want to go forward or do we want to return to the failed policies of the past? Yeah, I heard that one. And, you know, he's making – allusions to to Wall Street and and policies of the previous administration and things. And that statement always makes my blood boil because the the failed policies of the past 
are well they're they're from much further in the past going back to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac like I said at the beginning of this Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have not had to behave like a business they've had the government there to prop them up we go back to these mortgage backed securities and these derivatives and these kinds of things if these investment banks and these people had to deal with true organic risk like we do is investors. They would have never made all those subprime loans. They would have never done all that crazy speculation. But because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are now wards of the state, were there to prop them up, they were free to run wild. I mean, it's like saying Wall Street just got greedy back in 2006. Before that, they never were, <laughs> right? I got news for you. Wall Street has always been greedy. Greed has always been around since the beginning of time. And, you know, you, you put that big pile of money on the plate in front of them. That's what they're going to go for. That's what they're going to do. And so we don't know ultimately what's going to happen to to Fannie and Freddie. But like you said, you make a very good point. In any case, whatever happens to them, we've got to be opportunistic here. And we've got to take advantage of of this bogus monetary policy and the, the crony capitalism that continues to be spread. What we have now, the Obama regime is probably the most fascist regime we've had because they are so in bed with corporate America. Now, listen, George Bush wasn't much better. He was slightly better, but not much, okay? Uh, so I'm not defending him <laughs> either, all right? Well, we have to qualify that, because many times if you uh, come out negatively against Obama, you're by default assumed to be a rabid George Bush supporter. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. I support Main Street. I support small business. And I know, look at folks, if we want to have cool iPhones. You know, small businesses can't make things like that. Small businesses can't make automobiles or spaceships, okay? But, you know, we need major capital formation in some industries. There's no question about it. Intel, who has a plant here in Arizona and many others around the world, you you can't be a small mom and pop business and make integrated chips, okay, and circuitry. Those are things that require clean rooms and teams of brilliant people and very sophisticated sophisticated software and in, incredibly complex manufacturing processes and all that. You know, I get that, of course. But the, the thing you have is you have this situation where when the government picks winners and losers, they never pick the little guy to be the winner. They pick Solyndra. They pick a big guy. They pick a crony capitalism. They pick Fisker. They pick Tesla. They pick Solyndra. They pick the, oh, that battery company that just went under. Nobody's buying the stupid batteries for the electric car. What a surprise. It's, it's like, here you have all of this. It's just fascism. Crony capitalism and fascism are the same thing, basically. And that's the problem. So Wall Street is has purchased the government. The government is in bed with Wall Street. And and the whole thing is crony. People like to portray Wall Street as a Republican and the environmental movement is Democrat. That's not true at all. I mean, Wall Street is, Wall Street likes big government. They love Democrats. I mean, they, they, there have been studies done showing that they support the parties about equally, but the parties are just two sides of the same coin. I mean, the only guy that was really any different was Ron Paul or Ralph Nader or Ross Perot. They really wanted change, but they were kept out of the system, out of the debates. It's a scam. <laughs> yes, know? sir. Yes, the sir. whole thing's a big <laughs> scam. But anyway, that's what it is. Did we cover the Fanny Freddie thing enough? Yeah, I, I think we've got that covered. All right. Let's talk about Warren Buffett. You know, I, you just no. got to love this hypocrite. I'm looking at a thing here that says, Buffett calls for taxing the rich while he sues the IRS to avoid paying taxes. And it says, billionaire Warren Buffett knows how to separate his social activism from his business management. Over the past several months, as advisor to President Obama, Buffett has been calling for additional taxes on the rich and telling a Americans, he also would like to pay more to the government. However, on November 19th, I guess this is last year, November 19th, obviously, the true side of Warren Buffett, that of the business mogul, came to light as he is now suing the IRS to avoid paying more than $600 million in taxes levied upon Berkshire Hathaway subsidiary NetJets. So here he's got a private jet company that Berkshire, his fund, owns, and he's suing the IRS to keep them from paying $600 million in taxes, okay? Total hypocrisy. 
pot calling the kettle black, right? I mean, no, just... I don't even know what to say. I mean, we were talking about Wall Street and, oh, it's Republican, but, you know, this guy's the poster child of Wall Street. It's Warren Buffett, Yeah. right? And everything that he's doing leans so far to the left right now. And, you know, he's his line that I found to be just maddening about how his secretary pays a higher income tax rate than he does. And you know this has been a big thing in the political campaign too. People saying oh, Mitt Romney doesn't pay enough in taxes. What's well, capital gains? He already paid tax on the money. He already paid the regular rate. And Buffett's not not explaining that, and, and then hoping that uh, nobody has access to court records or press releases to see he's suing the IRS to not have to pay these taxes for, like you said, of all things. Private jets. I mean, it sneaks to high heaven. Yeah, totally. It's it's mind boggling. It really is. People like Warren Buffett are, are very eager to give other people's money to the government to spend. I I had a friend to post on Facebook today. Uh, you know, and he's a very conservative guy and and really likes to get a rise out of people. He said that he went and he gave blood on his own free will and on his own choice, and it felt great to do charity. And I I joked with him. I said, you mean a bureaucrat didn't write you a letter telling you that it was the right thing to do and, by the way, threatening you with civil and criminal penalties if you didn't do the right yeah, thing? Right, right. <laughs> and, and this went off on a whole tangent. But that's the fact is – you know, he's talking about, oh, more taxes, more taxes, and, and he's going to flush millions of dollars in legal fees down the toilet, fighting with the IRS. Why don't you just send the IRS a check, Warren? I'm sure the IRS will be happy to take Warren Buffett's check if he wants to pay more taxes. It is total blatant hypocrisy. But, you know, see, here's what we get into. I mean, look, I just I just filed a September, well, not the 15th, but depends when the Monday falls, but like, I don't know, September 17th or 18th, whatever it was this year, was the final extension date for corporate tax returns. So I have several entities, so I filed hundreds of pages of tax returns on the last extension day. Seems like every year I want to get my taxes done early, and it never quite happens that way. But anyway, and then on the last extension day the following month, just a, a little over a week ago, in October, I filed my personal taxes, hundreds of pages long also, okay? All of these complicated tax returns. I mean, the bills to the CPA are in the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, okay? It costs a ton of money. But I got to tell you, what Mitt Romney said during that second debate was so true because he he talked about eliminating the loopholes and making the tax code flatter. And, you know, Steve Forbes with his flat tax. I mean, look at folks, understand, I am benefiting from the system as it is. I don't know why I'm complaining, you know, and railing against it because really I'm winning the game. I mean, I hardly pay any tax at all. I I make a great living, by the way. And I don't pay much at all, I got to tell you, because I have so many deductions. I've got all these businesses, I've got all this real estate, and the non-cash write-off from depreciation on real estate is nothing short of a gift from God. I mean, it is it is the best write-off if you can qualify as a real estate professional and take advantage of all those passive losses. It's phenomenal. It's just unbelievable. I pay almost nothing. I mean, it's it's amazing because the other reason I pay so little in tax is because I do what I think Robert Kiyosaki really illustrated the best, where he has those squares and rectangles, and he talks about like the way the money comes into your life. You make an income, okay? So say you're an employee, you make an income, and then you pay taxes, and then what's left over, you get to spend money and pay for your life. Now... Uh, entrepreneurs, and keep in mind, if you don't own a business, but you're just a real estate investor, that is a business. And you will have some nice deductions from that business. There are travel deductions available to you, possibly. There are business expenses. There are educational expenses. You, what if you fly out to my Meet the Masters event from from Europe? Okay, yeah, well, no, you have a different tax code if you're in Europe. Well, you might be an American living in Europe. Anyway, too complicated. 
Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, say you're in New York and you fly to Southern California to go to the Meet the Masters event and, and that education, if you're a real estate investor, you can start deducting a lot of these things. Meals and entertainment, cell phone bill, uh, a whole bunch of things. You know, even a home office might be available to you. I don't know. I'm not a tax advisor. Check with your tax advisor. I'm not qualified, okay? And legal stuff, people, you got to stop asking me about LLCs and all this kind of stuff. I'm not a lawyer, okay? So check with a lawyer, all right? Yeah, well, it, it, it's very interesting on this. They, you know, it, it's popular politically, well, at least with approximately half of the country, to say we need to increase taxes on the rich. I mean, you could do that, I guess, but there's a reason that they're rich. Taxes are life's biggest expense. And they didn't get rich by paying through the nose on taxes. And the funny thing is, is the congressmen and the senators and all these people who write the tax code, they don't want to pay higher taxes either. You know that they're putting those loopholes and those deductions in there for them to use. So you raise taxes on the rich, you end up punishing the people who are none the wiser, you end up punishing the middle class. The rich aren't going to pay more taxes, they're not going to do it. And there's too many ways to get around it. I mean, it's, it's clear that Taxes can get to a point where people will take evasive action. They will do anything that they can to get out of them. We could argue about whether that's moral or what their obligation to society is. We do that, but that's beside the point. People will try to get out of paying uh, more taxes. And that's what is in Warren Buffett's bones here. Right. Despite all of his rhetoric about people need to pay more. Well, when it comes to get out the checkbook now, nah, I'd rather sue the IRS. Yeah. Hey, it's the old don't do what I do. Do what I say. <laughs> Hypocrisy. But I just wanted to finish that example I was giving, though, Steve, because it's really instructive. So when you're an employee and, and you don't have real estate as a business and you don't have a business of your own, you know, if you're an employee, you should definitely have some kind of business on the side. I've always said that a place where you can gain some tax benefits and deductions. And so you get to pay for your life based on the net. But as a business owner and a real or and or a real estate investor or a blend of both, you get to pay for your life after you get the income, but before you pay the government on many of the items. Because many of those items are business expenses that you can legitimize into your business, and then you only pay tax on the net, not the gross. It is an incredible, incredible difference. And taxes are life's largest expense. And then, you know, we don't even need to explain depreciation and passive loss write-offs. I mean, those are... uh, that's the biggest gift ever because that's a totally non-cash write-off. So nothing could right. be better than that. But but yeah, Warren Buffett, just ridiculousness. And, you know, the other thing to say, Steve, is he's an insider. Like, remember when the financial crisis was really bad and he went and put like, I don't know, $5 million into Bank of America stock or something and bragged about how he was buying stock in Bank of America? Well, he didn't pay the same price you were paying on the open market. This is just, it's cronyism to the max, folks. You just you can't trust these people. Trust yourself. That's who to trust. Hey, enough on this uh, berating Buffett. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've beat him pretty good. Okay, good. So I hope I don't get a phone call on that. But if I do, you know, I'd love to have him on my show. But I hear that he only does interviews with good-looking female reporters, or or, or you buy his lunch with Warren at a charity event and pay two hundred thousand dollars to have lunch with him. Well, if he calls you, conference me in because I have some questions. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. But the other thing I want to just remind everyone everybody of before we go to today's guest is that, and I've mentioned this uh, a few times, but not much. We have a referral program. And if you hold a real estate license, or if you're in a country where a real estate license is not required, we can pay you referral fees on business you refer to us. And Randy, a financial planner that I've had on the show before, an RIA, a registered investment advisor, I should say, he wrote me an email recently and he said, he was talking about one of the clients he referred to us. And he said, Jason, I just got off the phone with another financial planning client who's going to buy some real estate, some properties. They referred to me by and 
This is one of our clients whose name is I won't mention, by the way. And he says, I'm writing you this email to let you know how much fun this is for me. Seriously, as an RIA, I am able to offer my clients literally every financial product traditionally available. That said, there are quite a few RIAs out there that can provide all or most all of these things as well. However, it's a huge differentiator to be able to incorporate real estate investments into my client's financial plan. Thank you for creating such a great system for me to help my clients. And that's Randy Lubke, who's probably going to listen to the show who doesn't even know I'm reading that email, but I'm sure he won't mind. I hope he won't mind. But folks, we have a fantastic referral program. So if you have clients and you're in the real estate business, I know we've got lots of real estate and financial people who, and and the financial people, by the way, listening to the show, and when I say financial people, I mean RIAs, registered investment advisors, financial planners, people working and selling various Wall Street investments and so forth. I just want to give you a shout out to say, hey, I appreciate you still listening to my show because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You're pretty tolerant of my Wall Street bashing. I must I must give you credit for that. But I, I know, frankly, a lot of you, you kind of go to work and kind of bite your tongue. And you know Wall Street's a big scam, but you're working within that environment. And you, you know, you look for the best products you can for your clients and so forth. And income property isn't for everybody. That's why I think hard money lending or private lending is so, so good because it's so simple, so much simpler than the properties. The return's not quite as good, but hey... 12, 12 and a half percent isn't bad. There's there's some great opportunities there too. But Steve, anything to mention on our referral program? I know you've got a couple of clients who are licensed, who are starting to refer business to you and you're their investment counselor. I know Sarah, Molly and Ari and Terry and Dave, you know, other investment counselors have all benefited from this. Any thoughts on it that you wanted to share? Well, first of all, you don't have to do any of the work. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we're here for. And we go through a lot of a lot of effort to work with our clients. You know, I'm aware of a couple of competitors to the company that that don't really do anything. They just say, "Here's a property. Good luck." I mean, we go through a lot to help these clients out, and and you can pass them off to us with confidence that we're going to take care of them, answer their questions, and go to bat for them when necessary. So it's it's pretty easy easy for you to do. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So keep that in mind. If you have, you can earn some nice extra income referring people to us. And this is all totally above board. You have to have a license to do it. And we can do broker to broker referrals. So keep that in mind. And make sure you get registered for our Meet the Masters event coming up. And Steve, thanks for joining me again today. And let's go to our guest. We'll be right back with our guest in just a moment. You know, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Penny, because Jason actually has a three-book set on creating wealth that comes with 60 digital download audios. Yes, Jason has that unique ability to make you understand investing the way it should be. It's a world where anything less than 26% annual return is disappointing. I love how he actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I also like how he teaches you to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered at a savings of $94. That's right. And to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series, complete with over 60 hours of audio and three books, just go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. It's my pleasure to welcome David Carey to the show. He's a senior writer for The Deal, which is a news service and magazine covering private equity and mergers and acquisitions. Before joining The Deal, he was editor of Corporate Finance Magazine and wrote for Adweek, Fortune, Institutional Investor, and Financial World. He's often appeared on CNBC, and it's a great pleasure to have him here today. David, how are you? 
I'm fine. I'm delighted to be uh, on your show. Well, the pleasure is all mine. So private equity, it's been something that's come to the forefront lately with Mitt Romney and Bain Capital, and of course what's going on with the election and sometimes ridiculous childish attacks. But explain to the listeners, if you would, first of all, what is private equity? Well, it's uh, something, and this is something we uh, attempted to convey in the book I wrote, which is uh, King of Capital, which I co-authored with John Morris, and that tells a story of Blackstone Group uh, and uh, the creation of the firm. And uh, also we talk about the evolution of the industry. And we also try to explain to lay readers how private equity works and how private equity firms make their money and the impact they have on the economy. Private equity is a type of investing where you deploy capital in companies privately rather than in the public market. And it can take various forms from injecting money into healthy companies for them to grow faster or infusing equity to shore up troubled companies and get them back on their feet. The most common form of private equity is what's called a leveraged buyout or LBO. And these are corporate takeovers uh, done by firms like Bain Capital, which uh, Mitt Romney founded, where you buy out a business from existing shareholders using uh, large amounts of debt. And of course, leverage is a synonym for debt. These types of deals got a lot of press during the boom years leading up to the financial crisis when you had a string of you know, like record-shattering $20 billion, $30 billion, $40 billion buyouts of very big corporations like Harris, the uh, casino operator, Hilton Hotels, and uh, HCA, the country's biggest hospital group. And uh, Dunkin' Donuts and Burger King were also gobbled up in uh, leverage buyouts. And by leveraging the purchase of borrowed money, the buyer puts up only a fraction of the purchase price in equity. And that magnifies the back-end profit when you sell. It's uh, similar to buying stock on margin or buying a house with a mortgage debt and then flipping it for a gain on your equity. One big difference, though, is that private equity firms aren't uh, responsible for paying down the debt the way a homeowner pays off a mortgage. Uh, instead, the company that's being acquired takes on the debt. It takes a debt onto its balance sheet and retires the debt over time using its own cash flow. So it's basically all leveraged buyouts then? Is that the way all private equity deals are structured? No, I'm saying, as I said initially, there are a lot of leveraged buyouts is the most common form of private equity. But it can also involve unleveraged deals and, as I say, injecting capital where you actually put in equity and take out debt. It can be the opposite. (laughs) But for mostly, they're debt-funded buyouts. And I also wanted to say that the best private equity firms outperform stock and bonds by a wide margin, and that's not just through the use of leverage, as I've described. They also get high returns by streamlining, improving, growing, and uh, improving the profitability of the companies they buy. And these are big firms with large pools of money from outside sources. They get their money from um, financial institutions. It, it's interesting, you know, in spite of the image private equity has of being, uh, a, at least what the Democrats say about it, being a job destroyer and the enemy of the working man, you know, the biggest single outside source of private equity money is public pension funds. So that's union money. Right, right. Uh, too. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, that is kind of interesting, actually, in light of the Obama attacks on Romney and Bain Capital, because he was accused them of shipping jobs offshore and so forth. And oddly, he's investing with union money at times, right? <laughs> That's sort of a paradox. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> he's oh, get, he's getting, that, getting the union a Obama good return on their money. He's asking private equity executives to contribute to his campaign. <laughs> some of uh, strange bedfellows in politics, for sure, huh? Yeah. Well, let's kind of drill down a little deeper on the attacks on private equity and Bain Capital and Mitt Romney, if we could, since it's so topical right now. Your thoughts about them? Well, uh, you know, it's the rhetoric is pretty heated, and it's not just coming from Obama. You'll recall that during the uh, Republican primaries, uh, Governor Rick Perry and Newt Gingrich, I think, branded Romney a vulture capitalist. And, uh, you know, the popular caricature of private equity artists is that they're kind of scorched earth financiers that slash and burn companies and leave a trail of lost jobs and ruined lives in their wake. You know, I've been covering the industry for uh, many years, and I think that on balance, private equity does uh, far more good than harm. 
you know, it's true that private equity firms focus first and foremost on their own profits, but the, uh, you know, the means, the, the most effective means to uh, generating profits is to nurture and regenerate companies, not to destroy and pillage them. And, uh, you know, that sometimes involves replacing management or jettisoning, jettisoning uh, unprofitable operations or reducing bloated costs and headcount, firing people. But, you know, these are the kinds of uh, moves that all successful corporations sometimes must make in order to remain competitive. You know, so successful companies constantly redefine and reinvent themselves to get ahead. And it's interesting in, in private equity that cost and job cuts often set the stage for future growth and future job creation. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, studies have shown that private, private equity firms frequently do tend to cut more jobs in some of the companies that aren't private equity owned in the first year or two after they buy them, but then they add jobs back at a faster rate, and the difference is even out after four or five years. So, you know, where buyouts have gone awry, uh, and, uh, you know, this is some of the deals of, of, of Baines that have been front and center in the press, is... Uh, this can happen when buyers pile on too much debt, and that's what Bain did in, in like four cases that have been written about extensively. These are where the companies initially did well, and Bain loaded them with more debt to uh, finance, a, award itself a dividend, finance a dividend for itself, and then the company's fortune soured, and the added debt tipped them into bankruptcy. And you know, these are troubling cases, of course. And it's only natural that the Obama campaign would blast away at them, but they're also the exception, not the rule. You know, when Romney uh, led to Bain, uh, the firm made around 80 investments, and the vast majority of them turned out splendidly, and the companies grew and prospered. And let me throw out another statistic. Despite the, uh, you know, the risk of default and bankruptcy that comes with the territory, because you're buying, you know, you use large amounts of debt to buy these companies, the failure rate for LBOs is actually quite low. Uh, a recent study showed that on average just 1.2% of private equity owned businesses defaulted every year from 1970 to 2007, a 37 year span that included uh, three recessions. And um, the failure rate for companies that pay out uh, debt funded dividends, uh, like uh, the Bain deals that went bad, it's even lower on average. And uh, I think, you know, lenders have to put up the money for these dividends, and they're, they're, they've gotten very cautious about the kinds of companies that uh, they're willing to do this with. And these, you know, typically these are companies that have already paid off a lot of debt, they have very healthy cash flows. They're very sturdy, and um, those are actually the kinds of businesses that uh, private equity firms prefer to buy, although Bain actually initially specialized in turnaround cases, which uh, you know you buy companies that really need to be fixed up, and those tend to have a higher failure rate. Yeah, and they'd probably have failed anyway if a company like Bain didn't come along and rescue them. That is very true. Right, right. Yes. Ab absolutely. It's sort of impossible to address a uh, question like that. They'll, they'll say, well, some of these companies failed. Well, all of them probably would have failed if, if someone didn't come along and, and help them out. But w when, when you look at private equity, I mean, is there sort of an average deal size in the private equity world? Oh, they range all over the map. I mean, at the, the top end, and you know, 2006, 2007, there was one deal that the granddaddy of them all was a Texas utility called TXU, and that was a $48 billion buyout by a KKR and TPG. But no, they run the gamut. They run, I mean, you know, there are thousands of private equity firms that invest in all size businesses, and they can. You know, go down to you know, you know, million dollar investments or less. The uh, sort of the middle tier of the market, which is deals up to maybe a billion dollars in size, or that's called the middle market. And then you have the large cap market, which is a, a, above a billion, and and then you have lower middle market and you know, small cap. It's just it's kind of like the the stock market, it runs a spectrum. With some of these private equity deals that are so large, I mean, you mentioned the big granddaddy deal, the Texas Utility Company, for $48 billion, billion with a B, large deal sizes. I mean, why aren't these IPOs? Why are they, why are they using private equity instead? Well, they, a lot of these companies were public at the time that they were acquired by the private equity firms, and their stocks had traded down. They had 
you know, some operating problems, maybe a few, a couple of quarters of bad results. Um, shareholders got restless. Uh, the board met. Uh, and it may need to, you know, figure out a way to maximize shareholder value. And so then the private equity firm comes in and places a bid that's at a significant premium to um, to the existing share price. Right. That's the example of the reverse deal. But are there companies that just want to stay private? with oh, private sure. equity and not go to the public markets at all that have never been public? Oh, absolutely. And sometimes, if, you know, if they, you, you want to have a change in ownership. There are a lot of family-owned businesses that would prefer not to uh, sell a, a stake to uh, into the public equity markets because they want to uh, uh, maintain a greater role in the business. And then you, this is a, a prime example of uh, one thing where, of, of a an area where private equity can be a more uh, palatable alternative to the public markets for like an entrepreneur who's reached retirement age. He wants to leave the business in the family. He doesn't want to sell it to a competitor and he doesn't want to take it public. So the private equity firm can come in and buy a majority or a minority stake. The family can, you know, maintain its, um, its presence and activity in the business and, um, that type of deal actually was uh, kind of the way that private equity uh, started out. So it's an alternative capital market. It's an alternative way of reaching liquidity. And uh, it's something that a lot of business owners just prefer. I, I would think, though, that the business owners would maybe be getting a, a lower valuation because there's so much money in the public markets. I mean, there's a lot in private equity, too, but the public markets are obviously larger. And do you do you think some of them actually make the decision that they that are going to take possibly a lower valuation, that they could do better in an IPO scenario than they could in private well, equity? Well, sometimes they do. It's, I mean, in the case I was talking about where they keep some grip on the business, they may be willing to take a, a lower valuation. But I will tell you... Um, there is something, if a private equity firm comes along and wants to buy a majority, there is something called a control premium that they pay. So uh, typically, they're willing to bid more than what the company, the valuation the company might receive in the public market because the private equity firm can can come in, call the shots, make the changes in season, not be a passive investor and uh, realize more value that way for itself and it's willing to pay up to do that. So uh, private market valuations are extremely high, and a lot of these companies are sold in very heated auctions with lots of private equity bidders. I follow these things all the time, and uh, uh, DuPont just uh, divested its uh, car paint business to uh, a private equity firm uh, called uh, Carlisle Group, and there were like you know seven or eight bidders, and they paid a, a pretty high multiple for it. So uh, yeah, I don't. It's you'd be surprised the valuations that uh, that uh, privately sold uh, assets can come in. Yeah, you know it's kind of interesting because I don't ever remember really hearing the term private equity before. Say, I don't know, eight or ten, maybe ten years ago. Where was it? I mean, obviously there were private companies buying other private companies. I mean, that's not a new thing. How long has it been around, or is it just sort of a new term? the lexicon, really? Well, I'll tell you, it's private equity uh, sort of uh, appeared on the uh, horizon around 1991 or 92. That's when I first heard it. It's originally people in the business were called LBO artists. And um, I think uh, LBO artists got uh, a little bit of a tarnish in the late 80s because uh, a lot of them were funded by the guy who controlled the, the leverage uh, debt and, and junk bond markets was Michael Milken. And uh, so a lot of these guys were funded by this um, chap who ended up going to prison uh, and as part of the uh, late 80s insider trading scandals. And uh, it was partly <laughs> to kind of add a little more luster to the image, I think, that they took to calling themselves private equity. I think it's kind of a public public relations. Well, thing. well, I have to say that the 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 name LBO artist does not it it sort of strikes me as a con artist. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't well, think that's a very good name. <laughs> so Right. Yeah. Well that's what they yeah, that was the that was what they were typically called or corporate writers that were right. right. The Carl Icons and the Boone Pickens and yes, the Carl you know, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah. That was a, a sort of a fascinating time in history. So all of that And stuff... now now Carl Icon, by the way, calls himself 
a shareholder activist who is no longer a corporate writer. So. <laughs> well, I bet he's mostly an activist for himself when he's a shareholder. Exactly. <laughs> More than any other. That's very, very interesting. But, you know, all of that stuff, really, that was such sort of corporate folklore in, in the 80s, and it, there was so much coolness around it with the, the movie Wall Street, of course, and, 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 and just all the stuff you heard back then, all of that same stuff really still goes on nowadays, right? I mean, there are corporate raiders who buy companies because they can split up the assets and sell them off piecemeal for more than they can buy the whole thing for. And they still do all the same things, right? Well, I think these split up scenarios, uh, you don't see them much anymore. For one thing, there aren't many, uh, you know, inviting targets out there. You, you don't see too many huge corporate conglomerates because a lot of the, the conglomerates, you know, the individual pieces didn't match up well and the stocks traded at a ridiculously low valuations. So the companies just, the conglomerates, you know, starting with, you know, RCA or, or Wix or, I mean, all, kind, all, all the big conglomerates that had been built up in the 60s, they all kind of dismantled themselves in the 70s and 80s. So there, and I wouldn't say that is the most common scenario you see in a buyout. You usually see, companies doing the opposite. They'll buy a small, the private equity firms will do a build-up where they'll buy a small core business and then they'll expand it territorially or into other products, um, uh, you know, complementary products and so forth through add-on acquisitions. They'll actually be in an, an acquisitive mode and build it up. They're not looking, to, the, the breakup scenario is not very common these days at all, although that was that's certainly what you read about in the 1980s, yeah. Yeah, well, I think the reason, you know, it got so much negative PR is because it always involved mass layoffs, right? Not always. Um, I think it, it, it just the whole idea of buying a company and busting it up, just, you know, there's kind of a superficial, uh, uh, <laughs> it's not a very appealing or, uh, or nice idea, you know, but the fact is that a lot of these you know, companies, I think, benefited from being sold off to, I mean, a, a lot of the individual pieces of the companies of a large conglomerate like RCA, they were kind of orphan businesses. They weren't really paid proper attention to by the head office. They were underfunded. And and in fact, you know, instead of private equity firms coming in and buying out these large mosaic companies, what you see big companies kind of uh, throwing off pieces of non-core businesses which private equity firms then buy up I mean a lot a lot of the uh, so-called you know busting up or dismantling is undertaken by the uh, conglomerates themselves it's not for their hand isn't necessarily forced right uh, it's not forced to do by, it. so by some you know, corporate writer I mean some of these you know the some of these stereotypes about bust up artists they kind of work their way into the popular consciousness and the same. I mean, it's the same thing about the caricature, caricature of Mitt Romney, you know, being a scorched earth, you know, financier at Bain. It's just, uh, you know, I mean, there's not, <laughs> you know, there's only a, the grain of truth in some of these stereotypes is very small. What I ask is, what's the alternative? For example, and let's just talk about Mitt for a moment, then we'll wrap up here. But one of these Obama commercials that I continue to see is the one about a deal Mitt did and how the factories were empty. In other words, there were no workers there because he shut them down and Obama's claiming he shipped the jobs offshore. But what they don't tell you is that maybe those jobs would have been lost anyway, maybe that company would have closed, and all of the consumers that are buying those products are getting them at lower prices and they're getting more choice. It's just such a misnomer the way they characterize that. And of course, what you said to your point earlier in the interview, which was that many of these union groups that support Obama are the ones who invested with private equity companies like Bain Capital, like Romney's company. So so aren't they the profiteers? Aren't they the evil ones? You know? <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they're, they're certainly the enablers, and there's a certain amount of hypocrisy involved. But it's funny, some firms actually uh, kind of, uh, some private equity firms have very good relations with unions, um, and others that are uh, a little more dismissive of unions, unions attack, you know, it's all, you know, I mean, there's, Nothing is is what it seems, and everyone has some kind of agenda. It's, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, the practices that Mitt Romney is 
blamed for. I mean, as I said, it's you know, American capitalism is you know that you don't have. It's not the a European style of capitalism, which has uh, more safety nets and stuff. It's really free, pure free market capitalism, and I think private equity is is the ultimate expression of that. And I don't think that's bad. I think you make a you make a company stronger and improve its bottom line. It will have all kinds of ancillary benefits. You're gonna it'll have a stronger competitive position. It will sell more products, and in turn, it will be able to grow and hire more people too. I mean, a stronger company is a company that can employ more people, and if you know, you're burdened with a bloated workforce. You're not. You're going to suffer competitively. You're going to lose revenues. You're going to be forced to make layoffs. I mean, it's just you know. I I think the free market model is you know really the the one that creates the most wealth for the most people. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously it does. It's not perfect. It's just better than everything else, as uh, I think Churchill said. One one last thing for you before you go. At the Republican National Convention, we saw one of Romney's business partners in Bain Capital talk about how they started that firm. And I think it made a lot of people curious. How does one start a private equity firm? You know, like what happens? They just hang out a shingle and then they go to investors and try and raise money. And then they go to businesses and say, hey, do you need money? Can we rescue you? I mean, yeah, there's some, that's what happened. I mean, that's what it was Blackstone. We, uh, the, the early chapter in the book was about the money raising, it was almost comical. I mean, these are two, like, it was Pete Peterson, uh, who was a former Commerce Secretary under Nixon, and Steve Schwartzman, uh, who was a, they, they had both worked at Lehman Brothers. Um, and, uh, yeah, they they were had star power on Wall Street, but private equity was a new business. They didn't have much experience investing, and so they just went out kind of hat in hand, and so they were going to raise a fund. And, uh, some of the stories they told about <laughs> about the slights they received. I mean, they they took a, a trip to Boston and uh, to MIT to talk to the pension fund to see if they could raise some money. And the, the person there had totally forgotten that they'd made an appointment to see them. And so they uh, uh, they were turned away in the afternoon, and they had to walk back. To the, 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 they were caught in the in a torrential downpour, and they had a hard time catching. A, uh, they were totally sopped when they finally got back to the airport. They suffered a lot a lot of indignities. And you know, private equity was not it was a new industry. And yeah, you you go out hat in hand, and they had to they had a very tough time making a case. And uh, I think I don't know that. I mean, Romney himself is said that Bain Capital had kind of a tough time. Of course, that business was spun out of Bain and Company, which is like a, a really well known and respected consulting business uh, founded by Bill Bain. And they just decided, you know, they use to bring all their managerial expertise to improving businesses. And they thought, hey. You know, we're doing this for other people. Maybe we can, uh, you know, make some money for our, ourselves as investors. And that was the idea behind Bain. But, you know, Romney himself said that it was pretty tough sledding uh, in the first two years. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, but if you, you know, you're interested in hearing about the uh, genesis of, of Blackstone, which today is the biggest private equity firm on earth. Uh, yeah, we have some uh, stories on that, and then you know, it makes for pretty interesting. Very yeah. interesting, yeah. Very and interesting entertaining story. reading, yeah. yeah. Sure does. Well, tell people where they can get the book. Well, uh, last I saw it was <laughs> still in bookstores. We've had it was the original hard cover edition was published in October of 2010 and then we came out with a paperback edition this year in February. It's certainly available on uh, Amazon if you want to order it there. It's called King of Capital, The Remarkable Rise, Fall, and Rise Again of Steve Schwartzman and Blackstone and the publisher is Crown Publishing. And uh, those who prefer reading it in uh, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, uh, it's been translated into all those languages, and I understand it's uh, in its fourth printing in Japan. So Fantastic. <laughs> well, David Carey, thank you so much for joining us today. The book is The King of Capital, and learning more about private equity, we often talk about the public markets and the various Wall Street scandals on the show, but it's interesting to hear about the private side, so thank you for telling us all about it. Well, thanks for having me on, Jason. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today.
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.